Good day, everyone. It's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm continuing my now long-standing series on hemostasis with a discussion of coagulation deficiencies, predominantly hemophilia. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the pathogenesis, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, and treatment of inherited and acquired deficiencies of coagulation. I do recommend that if you are not familiar with the coagulation cascade, to consider first watching my video on that topic to get the most out of this video, but here's a 60 second summary. The coagulation cascade is a complex system of enzymes in which injury to a blood vessel wall triggers a specific sequence of reactions in which one enzyme activates another, which then activates another, and so on, with each enzymatic step amplifying the reaction. Near the end of the sequence is the activation of thrombin, which then has the final result of cross-linking a non-enzymatic protein called fibrin, which comprises the majority of a blood clot. The traditional model of this cascade is one that's in most introductory physiology texts, all board review books, and which is taught in most medical and nursing schools. This model focuses on the dichotomy of the parallel so-called extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, which feed into a common pathway where thrombin is activated and fibrin cross-linked. Contemporary thinking, however, is shifting towards a slightly different paradigm in which the focus is not two separate pathways, but rather four key multi-component complexes, each of which consists of an activating clotting factor enzyme, a cofactor, and the enzyme substrate. The initiation phase of clot formation is caused by tissue factors exposure to vascular injury. This is followed by the amplification phase, which is dependent upon something called intrinsic tenase. This is one of the key multi-component complexes, which in this case consists of activated factor eight and activated factor nine. When it comes to hemophilia, this intrinsic tenase, or a lack thereof, is critically important. The end result in the contemporary model is the same common pathway. Another concept from a prior video that I want to very briefly revisit is the mixing study originally discussed in lesson four. Clotting tests can be abnormal due to either a clotting factor deficiency or due to an inhibitor of normal factor activity, such as an antibody. A mixing study differentiates between deficiencies and inhibitors. Here's the basic idea of how it works. For a patient who has an abnormally long clotting test, either PT or PTT, the lab creates a one-to-one -one mixture of the patient's plasma and pooled normal plasma from donors. The abnormal clotting test is then rechecked. If the test has normalized, the patient has a factor deficiency. If the clotting test does not normalize, the patient has a factor inhibitor. The only reason a mixing study can work is because clotting tests generally only require factors to have 50% of normal activity in order for the test to be normal. So now let's discuss some coagulation deficiencies, and the most significant of these is hemophilia. Hemophilia is an inherited predisposition to bleeding caused by a deficiency in a clotting factor. The most common forms are hemophilia A, which is a deficiency of factor 8, and hemophilia B, a deficiency of factor 9. They are indistinguishable without lab tests. An interesting historical side note about hemophilia B is that it is sometimes referred to as Christmas disease, not after the holiday, which I think a lot of people just assume, but rather after the first described patient, Stephen Christmas. Unfortunately, Mr. Christmas was dependent upon blood transfusions for survival, and he died from AIDS after contracting the infection via transfusion before donated blood was routinely screened. This was a fate that killed nearly half of the hemophiliacs of that generation. There is also a form of hemophilia caused by an inherited deficiency of factor 11 that is sometimes referred to as hemophilia C. This is much, much more rare than the other two, and I won't be talking about it specifically, but the same information generally applies. Hemophilia is classified as severe, moderate, or mild based on the activity of the relevant factor. About one half of patients are classified as severe. Both hemophilia A and B are inherited in an X-linked recessive fashion, but one-third to one-half of cases are sporadic, meaning they arise from new spontaneous mutations. The net consequence of this is that almost all severely affected patients with hemophilia are male, 
female carriers can rarely be severely affected, but when symptomatic, symptoms are usually mild. Hemophilia has no significant ethnic or racial predominance. Let's talk about the clinical manifestations of hemophilia. Severe hemophilia usually presents before the age of 1, sometimes at birth. Sites of bleeding varies a little with age. In infants, for example, CNS bleeding is relatively common. In young children, as they are first learning to walk and becoming more and more active, they'll have easy bruising, forehead hematomas from minor head bumps, and hemarthrosis, which is bleeding into a joint. Repeat hemarthrosis in the same joint can lead to the development of a, quote, target joint, in which the same joint becomes increasingly likely to be a source of bleeding, leading to chronic pain and disability, called hemophilic arthropathy. And then as a teen or adult, hemarthrosis again, intramuscular bleeds, CNS bleeds, epistaxis, and in both the GI and GU systems. And at any age, there will be prolonged bleeding after trauma or invasive procedures, including dental work. Mild and moderate hemophilia may only manifest following trauma or procedures. And clinically apparent bleeding following trauma or surgery, irrespective of the severity of hemophilia, can be delayed by days or even weeks. A diagnosis of hemophilia should be suspected by the combination of three findings. First, a consistent bleeding history, unless the diagnosis is being considered while screening for disease in family members of a person with established hemophilia. The PTT is prolonged, but corrects with a mixing study, though the PTT may be normal in mild cases. And the PT, INR, and von Willebrand factor antigen are all normal. If these three things are present, then individual factor activity levels should be measured with the purpose of confirming the diagnosis, establishing the hemophilia type, and classifying its severity. And then, how do we treat hemophilia? For serious or moderate acute bleeding, treat with the relevant factor immediately. The general target for activity level depends upon the severity of bleeding. With serious, life-threatening bleeding, 100% activity is the goal. For moderate bleeding, 50% of activity. And for mild bleeding, local therapy such as compression is usually sufficient. Anti-fibrinolytic therapy can be used as an adjunct, but does not substitute for the factor. For chronic management, if possible, patients should have multidisciplinary care coordinated by a hemophilia treatment center. Obviously, the availability of such care will depend on where the patient lives. Avoid medications that increase bleeding risk, so most obviously anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications, including aspirin, but also things like NSAIDs. This doesn't mean that aspirin and NSAIDs can never be used in such patients, but should only be used very cautiously and with careful consideration of the risk-benefit ratio. Exercise should be encouraged because exercise has cardiovascular benefits for everyone, but a safety assessment of athletic regimens should be individualized. Prophylaxis with the relevant clotting factor should be considered in those with severe disease, though the cost of this can be prohibitive. Moving on from hemophilia, let's discuss acquired coagulation deficiencies. Some of these have to do with vitamin K. To remind you from an earlier video in the series, the letter K comes from the German word for clotting vitamin. It is necessary for the post-translational modification of several enzymes in the clotting cascade, and thus a deficiency can lead to problems with coagulation. There are multiple forms of naturally occurring vitamin K. Vitamin K1 is found in green vegetables, while vitamin K2 is synthesized by normal gut bacteria. Vitamin K requires intact small bowel and pancreatic function for effective absorption. From this, we can deduce causes of vitamin K deficiency. Severe malnutrition, particularly in absence of vegetables. Antibiotics, which can indiscriminately kill off beneficial gut bacteria. And malabsorption, including small bowel problems such as celiac disease and IBD, as well as problems with the pancreas caused by things like cystic fibrosis and chronic pancreatitis. The next condition is an acquired factor inhibitor. This is clinically similar to hemophilia, but is caused by antibodies that either inhibit or increase the clearance of a clotting factor, usually factor 8. This is a rare condition that is associated with malignancy, autoimmune disorders, 
and the postpartum state. A diagnosis is based on a consistent history combined with normal PT-INR and the prolonged PTT, which does not correct with a mixing study. The elimination of acquired factor inhibitors requires immunosuppression, such as prednisone or cyclophosphamide. Now, although an acquired factor inhibitor is sometimes referred to as, quote, acquired hemophilia, this term should be avoided to prevent affected patients being erroneously labeled as having true hemophilia, as these have significantly different treatments. To make things more complicated, anti-factor antibodies can also occur in patients with true hemophilia who have been treated with factor replacement. And then there are some miscellaneous coagulation deficiencies, which we've discussed earlier in the series. For example, obviously anticoagulant use. Advanced liver disease leads to a decrease in both procoagulant and anticoagulant factors, and globally dysregulated hemostasis. Conventional coagulation tests, such as the INR, do not accurately reflect the risk of bleeding and cirrhosis, though it is a marker of the severity of the liver disease. And last, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which I talked about in Lesson 8 on thrombocytopenia. DIC has both acute and chronic forms, though clinically relevant bleeding is usually only seen in the acute form. The acute form is associated with both a deficiency of platelets and of coagulation factors. Here's a summary table of the conditions I discussed in the video. I'm not going to read through it all, but there are three highlights. First, while an inherited coagulation deficiency could theoretically occur with any clotting factor, the only two which are not profoundly rare are hemophilia A and B, affecting factors 8 and 9 respectively. Second, when a patient has a normal PT and INR, but has a prolonged PTT, in the absence of anticoagulant use, this suggests the possibility of hemophilia or of an acquired factor inhibitor of the intrinsic pathway. However, as discussed in Lesson 10 of this series, von Willebrand disease is a much more common cause of this pattern, which is sometimes classified as a disease of platelet activity rather than of one of coagulation. However, since one of the actions of von Willebrand factor is the stabilization of factor 8, Von Willebrand disease actually spans both categories of platelet problems and coagulation deficiencies. And the last highlight, the only disorder of coagulation in which an abnormal coagulation test does not normalize with a mixing study is an acquired factor inhibitor. Thanks for watching this video on coagulation deficiencies. I hope you found it helpful. The next video in this series on hemostasis will be on hypercoagulable states.